Good evening, friends, and welcome to another edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. We are retired New York City police detectives and 9-11 World Trade Center first responders. If you like all things true crime related from the police detective's perspective, you're in the right spot. Hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you'll all get all things Duty Ron and Ed Wallace when we go live or upload another video. Hey, tonight, as we promised, we are going to have a computer crimes and forensic expert. He's going to go over cell phone data and computer uh, related uh, investigations as it pertains to Stefan Stearns. This is a case that has all of our, it's tugging at our heartstrings. And I know that all of you out there are invested in justice, justice for Madeline Soto and whoever and whomever, if it's plural, if there's additional people that are involved in it, we want to see them brought to justice. But here we have an ideal situation as far as an investigator goes. We have Stefan Stearns on ice. He's locked up and is not going anywhere. This is advantage investigator. And any good investigator will tell you it's always great to have your perpetrator on ice and not have to scurry to get information and get all of the investigative data. When you have him locked down as he is with all of these 62 charges, heinous charges for that matter, I mean, I don't even like to speak about them. These charges make my stomach ill. It makes me physically ill when I talk about this stuff. But there, there are evil people walking amongst us. And I think it's important that we cover these things and cover them with respect for the victim, first and foremost, and for the families who are left behind. So I want to play a quick little piece for you guys quickly before I bring on my guest. I mean, this NYPD computer crimes expert is going to blow your mind with some of his knowledge. And I have Mike King from Profiling Evil. He's in the green room. He's waiting to come on. We're going to jump into this in two seconds. Let me just set this up for you guys. They aren't murder charges, but instead are the consequences of what was found on his phone. Well, she's Megan Milano joins us live from the Oswego County Jail where Stearns is being held. And Megan, these charges could put him away for life. Yes, dude, that's exactly right. So the charges vary from sexual battery on a child under 12 to lewder lascivious molestation. Now, the state attorney's office says both of those are felonies. Both of them could lead to life in prison if convicted. While law enforcement agencies across Central Florida were investigating the disappearance of 13-year-old Madeline Soto, detectives with the Kissimmee Police Department found pictures and videos on Stephen Stearns' phone leading to his arrest just days after Madeline went missing on charges of sexual battery with a child, capital sexual battery, and possession of material depicting sexual performance by a child. This is video of Stearns being taken to the Osceola County Jail. That Friday, Madeline's body was found near Hickory Tree Road. Officials believe Stearns was spotted near the location earlier in the week, hours after surveillance video captured Madeline's body in Stearns' car. Now, the state attorney's office has filed 60 new charges against him, including eight counts of sexual battery on a child under 12, five counts of sexual battery with a child 12 to 18, seven counts of lewd or lascivious molestation, and 40 counts of unlawful possession of materials depicting sexual performance by a child, 10 or more images. In a statement, State Attorney Andrew Bain says the State Attorney's Office has been working closely with KPD and received evidence that gave us cause to file formal charges against Stearns. We appreciate the thoroughness and detailed attention of their investigation and will continue to work with our law enforcement partners to build a strong case against the defendant. We requested an interview with Kissimmee Police regarding these charges and the murder investigation. They declined and referred us to a statement from Chief Betty Holland that says in part, with this being a complex case with many facets, our work is not done and we are continuing our investigation into the timeline leading up to Madeline's death. For now, Stearns is being held here at the Osceola County Jail on no bond. According to court documents, they show that he'll be back before a judge on April 2nd for his arraignment. For now, we're live in Osceola County. Megan Mulatto, WESH 2 News. The state attorney's office says sexual battery on a child under 12 is a capital felony. Charges of sexual battery with a child 12 to 18 and lewd and lascivious molestation are first-degree felonies, all of which could lead to life in prison if Stearns is convicted. 
And they have damning evidence against Stefan Stearns, an overwhelming amount of evidence. It's been calculated that over 400 images and or videos on his phone. Guys, again, before I go into this, I just want to say I tip my cap to these police departments that were involved. We know the Orange County Sheriff's and the Kissimmee Police Department, which is they're doing a bang up job in collecting evidence and doing what they can to bring justice for our victim here. So without further ado, I want to introduce Anthony Santilli, uh, Santilli uh, a good Irish guy, uh, a retired NYPD computer crimes detective. He's got his own business that's going on now. He's the director and managing, he's the founder and managing director of Bite Hounds, which is a private investigation consulting group specializing in cyber focused investigations and digital forensics. Prior to starting Bite Hounds, Anthony, again, was a uh, NYPD detective. Um, he was in Homeland Security Investigations Task Force. Uh, he was assigned also to the Computer Crime Squad and the Regional Internet Crimes Against Children's Task Force. So without further ado, my good friend, Anthony Santilli. Thank you, Anthony, for joining. Thank you, Ron, for having me on. Anthony, you know, this is a tough case. And um, whenever we have children involved, it's a sensitive thing. You know, a lot of people have emotions and they want to see people locked up, you know, bring the mom in, haul the mom in. Her, her boyfriend, we have uh, an overwhelming amount of evidence on him. It's easy to get emotional on this stuff. Um, but quickly, I wanted to just go to you briefly just to give the listening audience just to, I, I suck at introductions. So give them a little intro um, for, you know, from your own, uh, from your own self. Just let them know what, <laughs> what you, what your experience is. Thank you, Ron. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, I currently am the founder and managing director of Bite Hounds, uh, which we are a private investigation consulting group, uh, and we assist in litigation support um, for attorneys to do digital forensics, as well as uh, conduct uh, private cyber-focused investigations. Prior to doing this, I recently retired from the police department um, last year. When I was there, the majority of my time was uh, with the computer crime squad. Uh, while assigned to the computer crime squad, I, I was assigned to a federal task force that specialized in uh, internet crimes against children, cyber crimes, uh, and we were responsible for conducting uh, not only the digital forensics to support the prosecution of all types of crimes, such as homicides, rapes, grand larcenies, but also we were, uh, many of us, uh, myself included, uh, were the lead investigators to conduct criminal investigations regarding computer-based crimes, including uh, crimes against children, uh, like this case would be, uh, or uh, computer trespass, identity theft, theft of intellectual property, and, and other types of matters. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a pretty impressive, impressive resume, I might say. I had your ex-boss, right? Dennis, he was re he's retired now. That was, that was before I was out there. Okay, with him, but... <laughs> he, he was the commander of the community crime squad, and he was a legend there, because as soon as yeah. I mentioned your name, you're yeah, like, I've oh, heard of him. Dennis too. Lane. Um, Many good things I've heard. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a pleasure to have you. We're going to get into the forensics mm -hmm. and the phone. There's so many questions. There, People are just going to be chomping at the bit. But before I get into it with you, I have another esteemed guest. He's a great friend. I'm, I am honored to have Mike King from Profiling Evil join us tonight. I consider him a good, good friend. This is a guy who came to me in the beginning when he first started on YouTube and said, Ron, help an old guy out. And I said, Mike, I'm an old guy too. So we're going to both help each other. Thank you, Mike, for being here. I appreciate you taking out the time <laughs> this evening. Well, thanks, Ron. When I think of the age difference, you're just still a boy. So uh, thanks so much. And Anthony, I don't know that I ever, if I ever met you walking the halls of the PD, <laughs> but uh, it's really nice to be on with you. Nice to be on with you too. Hey, Mike, I wanted to go to you because, you know, Profiling Evil, and if you guys, if you don't know Profiling Evil, you're, you're behind the game. He has a wonderful YouTube channel where he goes into all of these cases and he breaks it down. I wanted to just get your take on this case because honestly, Mike, and, and don't crucify me for this, I haven't checked your channel to see if you did any coverage on this case but i wanted to go to you first and foremost because i value your thoughts and your opinions as it pertains to this case well thanks ron and you know you know me i mean i, I move a little slower than 
than you and others on getting information out, mostly because I'm still whacked up in that uh, profiling brain of mine of trying to understand the the reasons behind the kinds of things that happen, the victim selection process, the the different crime scenes. And in this one, man, we're seeing some really interesting crime scenes because we clearly, as we look at this thing over time and now with the um, with the cr- the charges that have been released, we can start to theorize, I think with a great deal of um, accuracy, that this child has been sexually assaulted for a number of years. And uh, we may find out that there are other victims that take us back into those um, charges that were the aggravating charges. And then, of course, the and they're all aggravating. But the series that we're seeing that tells us this has been going on. Also, we know that looking through some of the Facebook posts and other kinds of things, that the relationship with the mother has been going on for four plus years. And, and if that child has been exposed to a predator in the manner that it's appearing in what he's being charged with, then we can start to theorize that the abuse started long before the homicide occurred. But um, we start looking at it and we start thinking about these crime scenes. And we, we realize that there are multiple crime scenes. And I always chat about this on my channel that that sometimes people say, well, what, where was the crime scene? Well, the crime scene could be multiple places that mm-hmm. that could be the home in this particular case. But we also know of a disposal site where this child's body was recovered, that uh, the disposal site is a crime scene. And uh, so each of these become really independently important in helping us understand the behavior, the motivation, and the processes that this offender would have gone through in order to try to be successful and make no doubt about it. In my opinion, these, these bad guys want to be successful and they want to keep going. Thankfully we caught him. Yeah, Mike, uh, well said. And, and we all know that Stefan Stearns, this is not his first rodeo. Um, he has a, a history that I looked back into going back almost seven years with the, um, with the mom, Jennifer Soto. So, you know, there's a lot of conflicting reports and a lot of misinformation that circulates and it happens in every case. Mike, you and I get this. People want to know, people want to know information. And when the police agencies, and and in this case, they're being tight lipped, um, when they're not putting out information, that's when stuff starts to swirl. And my thing too is, is I'm guilty of it. I I looked at a, a marriage certificate and I made a mistake and said that they were married. But you know what? I'm the first to admit that we're just human here, and that sometimes these live shows you make a mistake. And I I re- I read something quick and I put it out there, and boy, Mike, did I take a whooping for it. But you know, <laughs> it just shows that we're human. You know, you, you know exactly, Ron. And the thing that I find so interesting is is the world must be afraid to make mistakes. And obviously we don't want to make mistakes that injure people or, or say something, but some things are benign. And I can't imagine being penalized for all the mistakes I made in, in murder investigations or, or serial sex crime investigations over the years, because I made a batch of them and I still do today, just like the rest of us. I, Anthony, I, I could go to you on this. How many times have we uh, made little boo-boos on on reports and got called into the chief's office or to the CO's office and you got some explaining to do? It happens. We're all human beings. Of course. I wanted to ask you quickly, Anthony, um, the, 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 def- the defendant here, Stefan Snerns, um, they he voluntarily gave his cell phone to investigators. Now, I don't know exactly, and none of us know exactly what happened if he signed, they had him sign a written statement. Um, those are always tricky. And, you know, with us in the NYPD, we dot our I's and cross the T's. And I'm sure other police departments, they do the same thing. But when you get a verbal like that, it's always something that you you cringe because you can always re- imagine that a defense attorney will fight this somewhere down in court and mike i don't know if you heard but and anthony they said that they're talking about speeding up a trial on these child sex ch- offense charges somewhere in may i don't see how that can possibly happen but mike um anthony i wanted to go to you on the removal of um, he talked about he talked about wiping his phone, but the removal of all the data on a factory reset. Now we don't know if it's an Android or an iOS device, but how difficult is that? And how does that process happen? Like, 
does the police department that's there just take that phone and put it in their pocket and run back to the uh, run back to their office? How does that go? And I know that people want to know what you know what the pr process is for that. Sure. Thank you, Ron. Uh, so the process for obtaining a suspect's device, first and foremost, you want to get that search authority, uh, whether it's consent, whether it's a search warrant, um, that's paramount. Because uh, without that proper authority, any evidence you gather is likely to get thrown out. So uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, the, the, the possible verbal consent uh, versus a written consent. You know, I always try to err on the, uh, the side of uh, get that written consent signed in paper, get that person's signature on the piece of paper. So if it is argued down the road, there's that uh, it's hard to weasel out of saying, I didn't know what I was getting into when I said they could search the device. Uh, so you always want to make it, number one, clear to the person that you're asking consent for that what you're asking for. You're, we're asking to search your device for all content, or we're asking to search your device for certain types of content. Mm -hmm. um, once we get that, uh, you know, then we would take those devices back, uh, you know, maintain proper chain of custody, uh, and, and then start the forensic examination. Yeah. And a, and a forensic examination is not a light thing because you have to make sure that, you know, you do not destroy the device. And, you know, I heard my my co-host, Ed Wallace, talks about this all the time, that they have these special bags you put it in. You want to try to power down devices so it's not getting additional information and so forth. But that's you, we'll get into that in a little bit. But, Mike, I wanted to go to you because I know you have some maps and we were talking about this uh, before we went live. The suspects the the path that he took not only on the day of this alleged crime but the days prior and the days um leading up to hit that phone being taken into possession it's important for police to put this roadmap together the investigators want to know where his and her movements were uh and and i'm and i'm talking when i say her i'm talking about the mom as well and also the victim because she had a cell phone that's alleged to have been left behind. But I wanted to go to you, Mike, on the importance of, you know, tracking the the alleged perpetrator and tracking all of the people who are around her. Victimology, we talk about the family was there and all the people who are around her. How important is that, Mike? <laughs> yeah, I mean, is, isn't that really the uh, smoking gun nowadays is, is the device? And, and the fact that we can recover, even if they do something like he did, a factory reset, we still have the transactions that are occurring on location through that device that are that are tied to the account itself. So whether he's on Verizon or T-Mobile or AT&T, they are, they are taking and recording those transactions that are happening from the GPS of the phone. That becomes kind of suspect. We'll talk about that in just a second, I think. But but the idea is we can still recover that. We can still recover some things in a phone that's been wiped. Uh, and this is obviously where Anthony's going to have to shine and I'll just back out of the picture. But but we can gather that information. And then if they're dumb enough to have their stuff linked up to iCloud or to Google and having it saved to a drive somewhere, then law enforcement can subpoena those records as well and be able to extract the data that's found there. Um, but but when you're ready, maybe we could talk about this area from a geospatial perspective, because you know I love maps. Listen, Mike, I know your time is limited here, so we could jump right into that because Anthony and I can go into other aspects as the show progresses. Um, if you want, we could, yeah. we could go there right now. I'm, I'm ready. I see that you have. That'd be great. Uh, well, you, well, pull the map up. I mean, a couple of things to think about, and, and Anthony, I, I would really love your impressions on this, especially with your esteemed career on on doing this day in and day out, working on device data. But uh, when, when we're looking at the map, I mean, this is where this guy was living. And it, we can pretty well say, hey, we know that his first uh, order of business was to say, hey, I took this child to school. So if we map that out and go with some of the most likely ways that he could have done that, we can get that pathway and we can say, okay, it makes pretty good sense. It even goes by that uh, church school that he said he dropped her off at so she could walk to school. And I mean, isn't that just ab absolutely crazy talk 
that, that that became part of his discussion point anyway. When you start looking at the area and the fact that, yeah, she's not walking over the top of these uh, busy roads, but she's walking alongside them. Okay, there's a sidewalk there. We can start to evaluate and look at the th- the area from a geographic perspective and say, eh, I don't have a problem. I mean, I saw a lot of news agencies that were saying there's no way she walked to school because of this uh, freeway system going by. Well, that's not true. You can see very clearly when you start to explore this thing that there's a way forward to do that. But the thing that's so interesting to me, Ron, is as we look at this, I wanted to bring in all the cell towers that happen to be in the area. So first and foremost, if we're thinking about data that's being recovered from her phone, this is the location of the cell towers. And uh-huh. and uh, when law enforcement's trying to get a good location on a phone, it happens by way of triangulation. So it might say, hey, this tower is pretty close to the home and this tower is pretty close to the home. And if I triangulate a third tower, maybe this one, and that's kind of given me that certainty range. And if you think about your mobile device, and I'd like everybody to do this while I'm kind of giving you this exercise. If you went to the map on your mobile device, you'd see that your location is moving around like this as it's trying to figure out and bounce off of those towers and figure out where that device is located. Think about the Barry Morphew case uh, with with, uh, Suzanne Morphew and the fact that the feds, I think, made a critical statement when they said he was running through the house. That's baloney. His phone was drifting. It's called cellular drift as it's trying to figure out. And the worse the cell coverage is, the broader that area. And that's why you'll see a big area of certainty around your little dot on your phone when you're out in the woods or when you're downtown New York City and it's bouncing off buildings and trying to figure out where it is, or if you're in an area where it's better. So when you think about this, I want to keep that in mind. Now, what this area has is also a microwave system. So that really improves things quite a bit. But again, it's taking these systems and then taking satellites and saying, how is this device actually figuring out the location? So when law enforcement starts putting this together and they think, okay, here's the direction to the school or here's the direction to the dump site, you have to start thinking about really what's the accuracy availability based on the technology. And sometimes you're lucky enough to get the GPS technology right off the device. But even that uh, in the best scenario could be, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet in circumference. But what it really does is it helps you impeach a predator who's saying, I was never over uh, by uh, Old Hickory Road, mm-hmm. or I never went over here, or I drove her to the Methodist church and dropped her off so she could walk to school. Well, well why doesn't your phone show that? Because at that same time, you were heading eastbound on this particular highway here, and uh, we got you burned over here on this thing. So um, it's not always tell me exactly what happens as much as it might be that thing that the officer uses to twist them and say, now I'm going to impeach you right now. That's where you get them in the interview and interrogation right there with this data backing it up. They say, like, we know that he had a flat tire. There's a witness who saw him changing a flat tire with this technology. You're, they're going to be able to tell him, you know, this is exactly where you stopped. Anthony, yeah. I want to go to you uh, for that, um, for this information that Mike just, I mean, all of it's legal, uh, not legal mumbo jumbo. All of this is techno stuff yeah. that I, it's out of my, it's out of my pay grade. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in terms of cell phone towers, when I was in the police department, uh, we had a whole unit dedicated towards tracking the cell phones, uh, tower records, uh, mapping those out, giving the investigator uh, an indication of uh, where that person was moving to from uh, based on the cell phone tower hits. And, and like Mike was describing, those the accuracy of that type of data varies uh, based on the connection type and how good the signal is and, you know, and whatnot. And also how spread apart things are. Uh, in a place like New York City, where you have so many cell phone towers to support so many people, the the difference in terms of um, how close you could get to someone, it, there's more towers, you know, so the vicinity. But then again, the amount of people within a certain tower at that point is going to be much more. Uh, with the GPS records, especially from a phone, 
uh, there can be a wealth of knowledge. And like you said, the, those, the, the accuracy of that nowadays gets into the, the meters range. Um, what investigators also need to be careful of is when they're doing a dump on a phone to ensure that the records that they're identifying as being GPS location data, in fact, is telling them where that person is and not necessarily some other location data. On your phone, for example, sometimes someone might take a picture and that picture might have geolocation data embedded in it. When the investigator is looking at it, they have to make sure that they can say that that picture was actually taken with that device and the metadata is not being carried over from another device that originally took the photo. Same thing with uh, sometimes a map, uh, a Google map search might generate a, a GPS, latitude and longitude location. And, and again, those investigators uh, are, are gonna be going through those devices and, and uh, you know, parsing them out for that geolocation information, uh, just like I did in the police department and just like we do now. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, the, the bottom line here is, is we know that there's over 400 potential images and videos that images and or videos taken and extracted from his cellular device. That doesn't, there is no conversation about his laptop, if he had one, his desktop, his uh, you know iPads or any type of other electronic devices. We are now just hearing about cell phone device. The cell phone device that they got from him is alleged to have pictures that put this uh, his crimes inside that residence. And I think based on what you just said, um, Anthony, is. Some of these photos have embedded locations attached to it. And I see this in my own Google Cloud that I have. If I take a picture out in Northport and then I come back home or I go to, to the city and I look at that picture while I'm in the city, it's going to tell me that that picture was taken in Northport. And it actually tells me where I was. So this is interesting information. You, you know, Ron, I, I want to just kind of piggyback on that because one of the things that I used to tell the PSAPs, the, the 911 centers around the world, and this was a few years ago as we were still trying to figure out the bounce back and how to rebid and get a better location is that especially on cases of a 911 or something uh, where you have someone who's compliant and sharing information, if they can take a photo and shoot it to you and they actually have that thing turned on, you could pull that location right from that metadata that Anthony's talking about and use that for a dispatchable address so that you could get a first responder there. It worked great, especially in, in places like, uh, you know, out in the, in the national parks when somebody breaks a leg and says, hey, I need medical help to be able to say, I, I just took a picture. And sometimes a text goes through better than a voice call. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but this technology has evolved so rapidly, but I think too often people want it to be uh, the end all answer. And it isn't. It still yeah. is based on the value of that signal right there. And it'd be interesting to see your many, many viewers that maybe live in that area kind of feed in and tell us what cell coverage is like, because I've driven through that area and uh, flat country is a whole lot tougher than even New York City or where I live out in Salt Lake City, where our cell towers are up on mountains with good, good clear shots to the people's devices. Yeah. Every location has different sets of circumstances, and I'd be interested in hearing uh, that as well, Mike. Uh, but here, at the end of the day, Anthony, I want to go and ask you quickly here, um, without giving away trade secrets, and you and I talked about this a little today when we debriefed, um, extracting the uh, information off of the phone. We I tried to touch on it a little bit earlier, but we got into another area. Depending on the device, I mean, and I'm going to let you take this, um, how difficult or how easy is it for investigators? Now, um, I have some confirmation that he was on Verizon. His phone was a Verizon phone, so he had Verizon service. And as we know, Verizon is, uh, we, there's a law enforcement liaison attached to Verizon. I think most major carriers have that. Um, and that's an added bonus. But I know Verizon was always friendly with us, at least in the Northeast. So um, I'm sure that it's just that way, right straight across the United States. Um, 
he he's he's got a Verizon branded phone. We don't know if it's iOS or Android, but can you just talk a little bit about some of the the things, uh, the techniques that are used to extract? Sure, Ron. Um, so whether it's on Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, you know, the various different carriers that are out there, in terms of a forensic extraction of the physical device, doesn't really affect. Um, uh, you know, the outcome there, uh, for the most part. Uh, that said, in terms of a device where they are saying it was factory reset, um, it's not likely that a traditional extraction of the device would have recovered the evidence in the local storage on that device. So, for example, uh, and based on different uh, phones make models, you know, and how that factory reset is performed and what's actually going on in the background. And not only the phone make and model, but also the operating system that's run it, running on it. Uh, that said, most devices, the investigators nowadays, because in this digital world, there's different places you can go to get that data. Uh, so for example, on, on a, if device happens to be an Android device. Let's say the phone was factory reset, but the SD card that has the extra data in it that has, that you can add more storage to, maybe that wasn't wiped and that's where they're recovering the pictures and images. That would make sense if particularly if they don't have any other records from Stefan. Um, so if they don't have the messages, if they don't have the phone call logs, if they don't have the data that's typically contained on the user partition, the operating system partition of the phone, it's likely that they might be getting the data from, uh, you know, external storage that was plugged into the phone or even a, a cloud backup for that matter. Uh, nowadays, people, you know, like the convenience uh, of backing up to the cloud. It makes things easy when your phone when your phone dies and you need to, uh, you know, recover it, or let's say you lose it and you need to get a new phone, you go right to the Apple Store. You don't even need your old phone anymore. All you got to do is say log into your iCloud and get the download of your, of, of the backup of your data. Uh, you know, so that's why I wanted when we're talking about a, a phone that's when we're saying factory reset, specifically that. And those were his as, words. Those yeah, were his words. A factory reset that tells me the data that was recovered likely was not from the memory on the physical device that ran the phone. It might have been an external micro SD card. It might be from the cloud, but without seeing the, the forensic you know, report of what they recovered, uh, right. there might be new methods and tools that you know, are, you know, in the, in the public sector, the government that are not privy to the private sector anymore, uh, now that we're retired, right. that, uh, you know, that could change things. But it, it, my, it makes, you know, it makes me say to myself, Anthony, because the, the images go back to 2019, it's, it's far enough back that it could be argued that this, most of it, or the older stuff was probably backed up into a cloud because if you look at the newer phones, they don't even have SD cards anymore. Now, granted, this guy could have had an older phone. It didn't seem like he was a working guy. It's a, from all reports, he was a mama's boy and you know getting money from his mom still and, and all kinds of reports. And I don't know how valid they are, but that could be the case here. Hold the thought for a second because Mike King has to has to run. He had limited time, and I want to just say this. Guys and girls, if you're not yet subscribed to Profiling Evil and Mike King, you're missing out. He's a good man. He'll bring it to you straightforward. He's about respect for the victims and their families, and him and I uh, come from that same school, old school adage where, you know, we put our victims and our families first, the victims and the family. So guys uh, and girls, please, I encourage you go over on to Profiling Evil. I'll link it in the description, but please give me about 10 minutes after we're done here. It's not there now, but I'll put it, I promise, Mike. Uh, we're, Mike. We're not going live. We're going to put in some, some paneling. <laughs> Final thoughts from you, Mike. Just, just that I am so appreciative of you and, and the work you do. Anthony, what a great opportunity to spend some time talking through this. You know, I think about these kinds of cases and the thing that keeps bringing me hope. Sometimes people say, why do you talk about it? Because you're just teaching people how to be bad. 
and get away with it. It's just not true because when offenders commit crimes, they become disorganized and they try like when we were little kids to get a do over and just clean up and walk away. And it's that time when they make the mistakes that good investigators can capitalize on it. And uh, I think we're going to find that this police department comes forward with evidence that shows where that data was stored. There certainly were probably other sites where he was going and visiting that they've already collected. And I think they're going to be able to put together a pretty compelling case. Right now, it sure seems compelling. And uh, to to duty, Ron, and Ed, thanks so much. I'll, I'll be seeing you on choir practice next month. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. Here's Mike King's uh, uh, Profiling Evil YouTube channel. I will link it in the description. We are going to be joining Mike, I believe, in May, right? May 6th. April, April or May. April, May, I, you're right. Yeah, May. I, yeah, this, this. listen, I'm going to be turning 60 this year, Mike. So I still have a little bit of retention and the memory uh, in the memory bank. May 6th, I know it for a fact. We'll Perfect. Be, looking, <laughs> that's what it is. I'm thanks. And forward. Anthony, thanks for all your work. Thank you, Mike. It was a pleasure meeting you. All righty. There he goes. Good Mike, night, everybody. Profile and evil, everybody. All right. Listen, Anthony, I, I, I got to go to the chat because we have 3,000 people who are hungry for information. Hashtag Anthony, hashtag duty Ron in the chat. I'm going to scan the chat for questions, but let me go to some of the supporters. And there's been many of them while we're talking, Anthony. Jolene uh, Cacciatore, another good Irish girl, says um, she became a YouTube member. Thank you, Jolene, for becoming part of the family. Positive Vibes became a YouTube member. Uh, and look, here she is, the Sarge. Ant. Amazing Ant. She sends $20. She threw 20 bucks at us. That's both of our friends. She introduced me to you. So thank you so much for the super chat. Angela became a YouTube member. Thank you for being a member. Creole lady says, any word on Maddie's phone? Now, we're going to get into that in a minute. Anthony, the victim here, Maddie Soto, it's alleged by her mom, and this is the story, um, that she just turned 13. She had a birthday party Sunday night. Um, she turned 13 earlier in the week. She had a birthday party and then went to school on Monday morning and left conveniently, left her phone at home. I don't know if they have her phone in their possession, police department. I think I remember the mom saying that we turned it over to them. Uh, but let's just say that the phone didn't get turned over to them. Are there options? And I will let you answer that after I go over to Sister Carol Ann Clark. She sends in a $20 super chat and says, thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your valuable experiences. Ed, too, wherever he is, he's in Sydney, Australia. He just landed about an hour ago. He's in Australia. So Ed Wallace is watching. I think he's in the chat. It's somewhere around 10 a.m. on Friday. Let's talk about the victim's phone, Anthony. What can police do if, let's give you the scenario that they don't have the phone, but they know the carrier, they know of her shared account. Let's hope that the parents have access or that, you know, 13 year old, I mean, my kids are that age, they had phones, but I had access to it. Let's yeah, talk so, about both concepts, whether they have it or if they don't. So uh, my understanding is one of the, uh, in one of the press reports uh, or the, the press conferences, uh, it was mentioned that they had uh, recovered some messages either in text form or in social media from Maddie's phone indicating that she was intent on running away in the woods. I, my understanding from that was it came from her phone, but I might have uh, misconstrued that. Or do you, Ron? Do you have any? Were you able to confirm that? I, Is that I believe that that was a. Uh, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure, but I believe that that was something that was rumored that she talked. Okay. About. She wanted gotcha. to run away, but it, okay. it could be. So, so uh, I mean, so uh, I'm certain that the investigators in this case, uh, that's that's going to be one of the first devices that they would go to, um, and especially with a lack of any other evidence. When you just have that missing person, you're going to go to the devices that person would use, especially at that age. You know, now, today's society, even prior society, there's runaways are a frequent thing. And more often than not, luckily, uh, that is the more than often outcome of, uh, you know, more, more often than, you know, these unfortunate situation. Uh, a horrendous situation for that matter, right. where 
so I would expect them to have gone to the parents and either gotten the, the, the mother to give consent for the phone um, or gotten a search warrant for that device. Uh, on, on top of going to the cloud so, so accounts. I don't, I don't mean to cut you off. I'm just going to stop yeah. it just for a second. And hold the thought, please, Anthony. And, and yeah, I sure. Um, so it's now coming back to me. I believe that the message was sent from her phone, but it's questionable of who sent it, whether she sent it or not, or it was yes. sent by the perp or sent by the mom, we don't know. Yeah. Um, but if they take this timeline and look at it and say, because the mom said that I kissed my daughter goodbye in the morning at eight o'clock and watched her get dressed. And we now know that that was a lie. The mo Her own mother lied because mm -hmm. the P Sh Orange County Sheriff in the press conference said that by 725 or 720 something, he was dumping her backpack, which contained her school issued laptop and and her backpack in the dumpster at their uh, uh, their apartment complex location Venetian village yep and so if if that text message was was sent after that or before it and they know a time yep. frame of you know she was murdered in between this and this time they'll put that together this is what we don't know right now but Correct. go ahead, continue with your thought. I'm sorry. Sure. No, you make a valid point there. Um, if this, I would be very curious to look in to see that timeline because it, for someone to text, hey, I want to run away into the woods and then that person to turn up dead in that type of, in that same situation uh, where they were intent on running away from, uh, I would question the authenticity of that message, uh, especially in a homicide investigation. And that could be a key piece of evidence to show that uh, there was knowledge uh, by uh, the mother uh, or someone else in the house of, of what was what was happening. Um, what I was saying before though, with the, uh, with the devices, at least with Maddie's devices, is the investigators, that would be their first you know, go. They're going to want to get the devices and see what was going on uh, on Maddie's phone. And in today's world, everyone's whole life is on these digital devices. Yeah. So it really gives you a good insight into what's happening. The, the biggest problem that any forensic investigator is going to have is to filter out that noise, to be able to key in on the piece of evidence that's pertinent and kind of shed away all the other stuff that, you know, might noise. confuse you, the white noise, exactly. Yeah. Um, and on top of the digital devices, you're going to go to the cloud accounts, just like the press, uh, uh, you know, at the press release, they mentioned that uh, they, they were talking about going into the social media accounts and seeing where she was and there, there wasn't active postings. Those are all things that are uh, basic and, and should be done in any missing person case, uh, you know, especially nowadays. Uh, where someone's logging in in social media could give you, uh, you know, just a, a proof of life at minimum right. uh, yeah. that, that the person is still alive, or at least someone has access to their account that's still alive. There's so much to this case. There are so many moving parts that we don't know about. And here's a question that's redundant in the chat. Heavenly, thank you for sending this question in. Will we get the autopsy results with her being a minor? There's two aspects to this the the issue of her being a minor she's 13 years old and there's an investigatory aspect to it what i do think that we will hear about and i don't know when but the cause and manner of death the medical examiner is going to determine the cause and the manner and that may or may not be released depending on who uh depending on if the investigator the lead investigator the the you know, commanding officer or whoever's running the investigation, um, if she makes that decision. And I believe it'll be up to Chief Betty Holland from the Kissimmee Police Department. So um, we all want to know this, but in different cases, we hear about cause and manner and autopsy results as it's an active investigation. But in a, in a case like this where we don't have a murder charge, listen, Stephen Stearns is in, on ice, and I have it written on little stick of notes all over my studio here. We, as investigators, have the advantage 
of having a perp on ice because there's no scurry. There's no urgency to quickly go and try to build the case. Not going anywhere. With these charges alone on conviction, he is spending life in prison. He's not getting the death penalty because, you, you, you know, the Florida laws, they are arguably right now, there's lawyers that are arguing that it, the, the new laws are unconstitutional. And that's all court stuff. And, you know, but this stuff happened before those laws were on the books. So that death penalty component would not apply to him here. But he would never see the light of day upon conviction. And he's got 62 charges, ladies and gentlemen, 62 charges. Um, so they are going to dot their I's, cross their T's, and make a nice bow and present this to the prosecuting state attorney and say, hey, this is what we found. And if that takes a month, it takes a month. If it takes three months, it'll take three months. The bottom line is, is it's about justice for our victim here. And um, we can't you know, rush. We want, we want information, right, Anthony? We're yep. all of us. We want that information. But this guy is on ice and not going anywhere. And believe me, I'm going to play this little piece right here. This is um, from the local uh, or Daytona beach, Orlando, Melbourne area. I want to play this quickly while we take a little break, Anthony. Yep. Um, so if you get, you need to take a, a bathroom break or anything like that, now's the time. Stephen Stearns will never get out of jail if convicted of the 60 new charges filed against him this week. Yeah, that is what a former officer turned professor says about the lead suspect in 13-year-old Madeline Soto's death. Well, she's Megan Mulatto found out why there is still no charge specifically for her death. And stand by, folks, because when we return back, I am going to ask Anthony about looking into this exact question right here. Grady 03 says they talk about a sex ring. They talk about Stephen Stearns dabbling in applications like kick and things of that nature and all of his shady and shaky um, postings that we see in Reddit and all over his Facebook. Um, there's a lot of things that make you go, hmm, about this guy. And I'm going to ask our professional, our computer crimes and forensic expert, how easy will it be for investigators to determine if this guy is into some shady shit? So stand by. Hold on to your uh, horses. No matter what, he's not getting out of jail. Professor of Forensic Studies at Florida Gulf Coast University, David Thomas, says if Stephen Stearns is convicted, he will never see a day outside a jail cell. Originally, they charged him, I think it was one or two charges in the very beginning. And, that, and that's fine because they got him off the phone. And so now what they've done is they've done a, a complete forensic analysis. There's no, there's no doubt in my mind that's exactly what they did. And he has recorded almost every incident that he had. Stearns is the lead suspect in the death of 13-year-old Madeline Soto. He was arrested for several charges, including sexual battery with a child, after detectives found pictures and videos on his phone. Then they found more evidence, leading the state attorney's office to file 60 new charges against him Monday including 40 counts of unlawful possession of materials depicting sexual performance by a child and eight counts of sexual battery on a child under 12. The charges, enough to be sentenced to life in prison if convicted. Count of felonies means that he will face life, he'll, he'll be in prison for life. And there's no doubt in my mind they have the evidence to, to secure, uh, for, to make those charges, they have the evidence to support that. Thomas says now the question... Basically what he said is they have... A substantial amount of damning evidence that will ensure a guilty verdict if he chooses to go to trial. And you know what? I feel, and, and we have a poll running up here, so go and check the poll. I feel strongly that there may be a possibility that Stephen Stearns, even though he will be advised by his attorney, what do you have to lose? Let's fight this. But I wouldn't be surprised if Stephen Stearns says, you know what? I don't even want to fight this. I'm pleading guilty because I know what's on my phone. I know about all the stuff that I did, and I know I'm a dirty, filthy savage. So there's a very strong possibility, and I'm not saying it's definite, that he may just say, you know what? You got me. I'm a, I'm a real scumbag, and um, I'm not even going to try to fight this. Question is, life in prison or the death penalty if Stearns is charged with Madeline's murder? 
He says there's likely already enough circumstantial evidence to charge Stearns with murder, but he thinks detectives with Kissimmee Police want to make sure their case is sealed. Is give them, give law enforcement and give the medical examiner's office an opportunity to, to do their job because it takes time to, to do a great forensic analysis. Is they want to make sure that, that justice is served and, and served properly. In Kissimmee. And that's what it's about right there. Justice for this tiny victim, 13 years old, just turned 13, Maddie Soto. And that's what it's all about. Uh, Anthony, I, I mean, again, I, I wasn't saying 100%, but there is a possibility that this guy says, you got me. I mean, he knows. Yep. He yep. knows what's on his devices. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about what I mentioned as we were playing this media piece here. He's, you know, there's a lot of cyber sleuths out there. There's a lot of people, uh, men and women, who are digging into his stuff. And he's got a lot of posts. Trust me, people are sending this stuff to me. I see it all day long. I get 15, 20, sometimes 30 emails a day about Stefan Stearns and showing me some of the stuff, the posts that he has and the, uh, the apps that he was playing with, these little uh, computer games, Pikachu and all the stuff he had on collecting, all of this kid stuff. He's all over Reddit. How closely would they look at his online platform and profile? Can you talk a little bit about that? We have the national missing and exploited children banner running down below. And I know that's important to you and it's important to all of us, but how, how closely would they look at this guy's um, online social media footprint? Yeah. So I, especially in, in a case uh, like this, um, th it's going to be an exhaustive look uh, at those social media profiles. Uh, I'd say anything they find in his device, if they find a, uh, uh, you know, an Uber Eats account, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'd say, I'd almost say like, they're going to go that deep. Um, yeah. I, all joking aside, uh, they're, they're going to look into those accounts um, as long as they can get the proper search authority to get the data from the cloud or whatever they can get locally from devices that they recover. Uh, again, that, that's, uh, I see them going pretty exhaustive in this type of case. Um, you know, in other cases, maybe, you know, they have enough and they don't need to dig anymore, or maybe there's no more leads to dig into. Uh, but in a, in a case like this, they're going to look for uh, any possible additional victims, uh, any uh, other images uh, of, of children on the device uh, to see, you know, what else might have been happening, um, you know, prior to this. Because uh, a, a person that gets to this point, um, th th there's more going on back there. A hundred percent. And I'm looking at the chat and some people are agreeing that he may plead guilty. And, I, and again, I didn't say that he was going to. I'm just saying we've seen this in the past where a perp knows, a perpetrator knows, he knows those dirty deeds that he did. Listen, there's 60 of them listed on one set of charges. I'm not even going to put them up because they are so vile. Uh, and it lists all of his dirty, filthy um, sexual uh, uh things that he did to this poor girl and um over a period of time that we could argue of her, what her age was when this first started this is what's documented on his phone anthony what about the shit that he didn't document and that's what really concerns me yeah. and, and, and again it gets my blood boiling and i waited for mike king from profiling evil to leave because he doesn't like the cursey words but I, I this this shit really boils my blood as a father, as a retired law enforcement professional, and as a human being. Uh, you you look at this situation and you say to yourself, "My God, when did this happen? What was he doing to her all of this time? When did this start? I mean, did this start from the moment he met Jennifer Soto?" And that brings me to ask you, what are they going to look at? For Jennifer Soto, are they going to look at everything that she's done back a year, back five years on social media, on her text messaging, on her communications to her best friends or people she confides in? What if she knew about this? Um, will they be able to look at her devices and subpoena them and go back and look at all of her stuff? So uh, that's, that's a good question, Ron. Uh, I'd say... It, it really depends on what other evidence is linking them 
uh, to Jennifer because at the end of the day, you know, yes, you want to get as much evidence as possible, but you got to get it legally and with proper authority. Uh, so to get the into the accounts, you know, they're, they're going to want to get the, a search warrant in front of a judge uh, and establish probable cause that they may find uh, the evidence they're looking for uh, in that account. Um, so if there's any communication between uh, Jennifer and Stefan that might indicate knowledge or collusion or working together, um, especially if that happened on a cloud provider, uh, you know, those accounts might become open game at that point uh, for, for, for a review or for, for a search warrant. Uh, but again, that, that's very dependent on the other circumstances of the case, which it's, I'm not seeing anything that would give them uh, access that's currently in the media right now uh, to go to those accounts. But I'm sure, you know, there's you know, the fact that they've been living together for so long, they're gonna, there's going to be communications on their devices. I'd say that they probably asked uh, Jennifer for consent for her phone uh, during this process, uh, as well as Stefan's um, and as well as Maddie's. So uh, I'm certain that they are looking into that. These things, like, like uh, you said before, these things take time. Uh, the investigators that are running this, this is not one person running this case. These are, this is a team sport. Um, so even when I was in uh, computer crimes, it, it was everyone working together on a case. Yeah, you had one person that was assigned to kind of manage it and, and run it, and it was your case, but everyone would pitch in with ideas. If you needed help or you needed a review or you haven't seen this type of account before, or if you haven't seen this type of piece of evidence before, it's exhaustive. There's so much to go through. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm certain that we'll, we'll get to the bottom of, of what's happening, uh, you know, by the end of this. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, thank you for that, Anthony. Uh, I proposed the poll to everybody in the beginning of when I first created this, uh, scheduled this live stream and the poll that I created, I'm going to read it right off my device, my cellular device, which is tracking me right now. Right, Anthony? Yep. Um, yeah. On my device here, there's 2,464 votes. The, the question I, uh, I put out to you guys, do you think murder charges are coming soon for Stefan Stearns or Jennifer Soto or both? Because a lot of people feel like the mom, and this is just a feeling. Nobody has evidence. None of us know how involved or how not involved she is. Um, the only ones that know are the case detectives, and they may or may not know. They may just be building their case. So I asked, do you think murder charges are coming for Stefan Stearns or Jennifer Soto or both? 2,464 people voted, and you could still vote right now. 29% said Stefan Stearns, 3%, only 3%, so a very small proportion of 2,400 people say Jennifer Soto is going to get murder charges and it's 68 percent and an overwhelming astounding 68 percent said both so pretty interesting uh, uh about what people are thinking here and i'm not going to close this poll until the end of the show uh because i want to give people an opportunity and a chance to continue to vote um so hashtag duty ron hashtag anthony we're getting close to the hour mark I promised Anthony I would close it up in about an hour. I want to just say this. Thank you to our moderators. Our moderators are keeping the chat classy. They work for nothing. They are the silent sentinels here. They are keeping everything moving smoothly. Give them props. Uh, I want to say Rochella and Pete Pranzo is a retired lieutenant from street crime, Harlem Raiders. Lieutenant Pete Pranzo, thank you for being here from the NYPD. And I hope your beautiful wife is healing up from the knee surgery. She had some complications. I want to send, uh, you know, strength and prayers to Rochella. Hopefully she gets back up on our feet soon. Um, so I'm looking at the chat. Katina is here. Uh, a whole bunch of people. There's Lieutenant Pete Pranzo. Uh, H. Cook says we've got the greatest mods, and I agree. Uh, good evening from Southern California. Rather be in Maui. Uh, I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't not say that I would want to be there. I'd love to be there. Uh, Creole lady says, 
mom is lying. She lied like a rug. That's a fact. She definitely did lie. And we covered that from beginning to end. She made statements that she saw her daughter. Um, she made statements that, you know, saw her out the door at eight o'clock in the morning, that faithful morning on Monday. We know that she was already uh, deceased by that time. And we're going to listen to the um, quick press uh, presser from the sheriff. This is the Orange County Sheriff and the uh, semi uh, police chief. And let's just listen to this. It's only three minutes. Thank you for being here. We have some important developments in this case that we want to share with our community. I wish uh, we were here to tell you that we have found Madeline, um, but we have not found her. Last night, detectives from the Kissimmee Police Department met with Madeline's mother, and they had to tell her the very devastating news that although we have not found Madeline, uh, we are now confident that she is dead. So our efforts will be focused on recovering Madeline. <clears throat> dozens and dozens of detectives, crime analysts, and specialized team members uh, have been working nonstop and following up on every single lead and every shred of evidence. Our detectives have determined that Madeline was never dropped off on the morning of February 26th near her school. Instead, we believe she was already dead at the time and that Stephen Stearns moved her body in the early morning hours on that day we have video evidence that shows that. So the reason I played this, and I'm going to continue with just us off the screen, Anthony, everybody can hear us. For him to say that we have reason to believe that he moved her and that she was dead in the early morning hours, they have to have substantial concrete evidence of that. You don't just make statements like that without major proof to back that up, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, they... It must it must be crystal clear in the video that that of what's happening, and yeah. I'd be, you know, yeah. I don't know if I want to see that video. Put it that yeah, way, because so, if, so, if there would be if they're able to make that assessment from that, exactly that that'd be a tough video to see. But these guys watched it, yeah. Uh, and they for him uh, he is the sheriff of Orange yep. County, yep. so he's the big he's the big cojona. Uh, and for people in the chat to say, oh, this is old news. We're putting this together for you guys so we can kind of break it down for you of how this investigation is going and how it unfolded. And it's important to circle back to these pieces because this is an important piece of the puzzle right here because this is what we know as of now. There's nothing additional that they gave us, but we could learn from this and from this piece of information as retired investigators. We know that they have to 100% if he's at a podium telling the public that we know that she was trans she was moved in the early morning hours then they got they got that on film so let's listen just a little bit more and then we'll come back and close it up first on that day we have video evidence that shows Stephen Stearns discarding items in a dumpster in that apartment complex in Kissimmee at 7:35 on Monday, February 26. Detectives later recovered Madeline's backpack and her school-issued laptop from that dumpster. At 819, we have evidence that shows Stephen Stearns returning to the complex and Madeline was visible in that vehicle. We believe she was already dead at that time. So that's huge. Um, the mom said that she saw her daughter off and she was saw her daughter getting dressed for school at eight o'clock. We know that that didn't happen. And that's what Anthony is making everybody suspect of the mom. Because yeah. she, she yeah. made that statement. It's a bold face lie right there. It's a or, bold face. Or, or a misrepresentation of the time, or, you know, yeah, but not likely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Again, that's that's why the internet is on fire, and Jennifer Soto is the most hated mom in in the United States right now, probably in the world, because you go and make. And I'm not going to you know bore the audience with listening to her interview because I have that queued up as well. But 
it's an outright bold-faced lie. And I made a video about it, and I don't call people liars just because. But if you make a statement like that, and your daughter is missing, and you are now consoling and hugging the very person who has over 400 images of sex acts over a long period of time with your own flesh and blood, then something is wrong. There's a lot of explaining to do. And she is now lawyered up, from what I understand, and silent. So silence is, is golden, but at the end of the day, if you don't have anything to hide, then why do you need to zip it? And she zipped it as soon as her boyfriend slash partner, as she referred to him, slash um, stepfather. She made a reference to him as being a stepfather. And as you and I know, we talked about this. You live with somebody for 30 days in the same dwelling, and you are now together. That's common law. You're common law married. You don't have to have a document. You don't have to have papers. If you're living with somebody for an extended period of time, we refer to it, at least here in New York, as common law husband and wife for the most part. So that's what happens. Um, Malligator said she sent me an email that she, about who she was married to. Thank you for that. I read it before we went live. Um, Alba, Alban Dillon sends in a $5 super chat. Thank you. Sandra, thank you for becoming a member. Hey, guys, if you're not subscribed, consider subscribing to Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace, where we bring forensic investigators and experts like Anthony on. He's a retired NYPD detective from the Computer Crimes Unit, and he's got a, a ton, ton of information. And we'll, I'm looking at the chat for any questions for hashtag Anthony, and I must have missed them. So I'm trying to see if there's any questions for you, Anthony, in the chat. I know that so, your, your phone's lighting up. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I actually saw some in the chat um, right, great. that was interesting. Some person mentioned that um, you know, why would they, uh, one of them I think here was, uh, why would they need a, a password for decedent's phone, um, you know, if, uh, you know, in some cases. Uh, and I don't know if, you know, sometimes, you know, depending on the device, and make and model the level of access, uh, not only make and model, but operating system like before, the level of uh, access a forensic examiner uh, can obtain uh, varies. Uh, right. So so that's why it's always best to get, um, you know, the, the password, because it's not always the case that it can, you know, you can get into those. Anthony Angela S. in the chat. She's from Long Island. Oh, she, hi, that, Angela. Was her. that was her. So gotcha. she's saying thank you. Um so what's most important here is that we get justice for the victim, for Madeline Soto. And justice, what is it going to look like? It's going to be possibly a long time before we hear a lot of information. Don't expect a world of information to be released. Um, here's one from It's Summer. Is it summer yet? And I hope summer is right around the corner. Hashtag Anthony, with all of Jennifer's lies, that's the mom, wouldn't that be enough to get a search warrant for her devices? Oh, um, uh, it definitely can be used uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, they might not need to, though, um, especially if they already, it sounds like they already hit the house with a warrant. Um, more than likely, they would have seized all the electronic devices, uh, which likely gave them the authority to search the contents of all uh, the items uh, from that house. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I want to just say this, too, like, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of details people will get, get caught up on. What's most important is, you know, the evidence, you know, the evidence that they have. And it's damning. We heard from I played a couple of, of news pieces where they brought down uh, retired professionals. The evidence that they have against Stephen Stearns is overwhelming and it's vile. And, and he knows it. He knows what they have. And he is probably cringing to see if they were able to find more on his other electronic devices. We're only talking about a phone here. What about old computers? And if this guy was keeping hard drives or keeping mm -hmm. his computers, he could have been doing this for a long time. And that's what I want to bring into people are talking that he was possibly taking photos and sexual videos and selling them. If that, in fact, was the case here, or if it is a, a possibility that that was uh, happening, 
you have to document it. I mean, he's not just going to be doing this by word of mouth. He's basically nope. going to be doing this by electronic means. Yeah. So it's going to be like, you know, um, like I remember in computer crimes in the NYPD, I went for an interview there and I got to see that back room where the group of detectives and they were all in the dark in the back in this dark <laughs> And, and, and I'm not even kidding, Anthony. You're laughing. No, I, I was there. I I went and I interviewed with Dennis Lane, and I was offered the, a position to come in and work there. Um, but they wanted this commitment from me, and but I went into that back room, and he told me they're on monitoring these child pornography people, these ped pedophiles. They're looking for the the people who are trying to exploit children, mm -hmm. and. Departments across the United States uh, are doing this and are always out there looking. But there's so many of these freaks and creeps and weirdos that are out there, sexual deviants. They're walking amongst amongst us. And my thing is, is if he was doing this, Anthony, what's the chances of that coming to light? Are we going to be seeing that down the road, possibly? Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a... a thorough investigation uh, in this matter. And li like you mentioned, all these, um, you know, uh, law enforcement professionals around the country assigned to these type of cases, you know, they are, you know, sifting through, you know, millions and millions of tips a year, uh, you know, of child exploitation material coming from, you know, uh, you know, places like NECMEC, the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. Um, so they're going to have a lot of resources to go through. They're going to have the, all the devices they need to parse. They're going to have all the cloud accounts and possibly any, uh, tips from the past that might've came along, uh, you know, police reports, phone calls, you know, anything that might've, uh, happened that they're going, they're going to carve through his entire history. And I'm certain that if there is proof that he, um, if the proof exists, I'm not saying that if he did it or not, but if the proof exists and the evidence exists, it'll, it will come out. Uh, they, yeah. they, they will find that evidence. Uh, you know, these, the people that are doing these type of investigations, you know, it, it, it takes a special person. They're dedicated, um, you know, and the colleagues we work with, you know, I'd say, you know, always you know, were totally committed to investigating these cases. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Yeah. And these detectives that I saw in those back dark rooms, um, they're in there for hours in dark, in the darkness, going in, looking all around on social media and looking into these really bad places where good people do not go, you know? Yeah. So, um, again, we got to protect our children, our children. And it sounds cliche. Our children are our future, but our elderly and everybody who is at a disadvantage needs a second set of eyes. And we, if you, you see something, say something. If you're a family member and you suspect that something is going on, you have to speak up about it because if you're silent, that's when things like this can happen where somebody can be operating and doing these bad things undetected. That, that's the question. Like, how could Stefan Stearns been able to pull off seven or more years of child abuse? sexual abuse the the things that is written out in these uh, affidavits are so vile and so disgusting that it it just pains me to even read it out i won't read it out to you guys we did it on the first set of charges and it was difficult at best this 60 page that i wrote out here i have it saved I don't even recommend any of you guys going and reading it because it has a lasting effect and there's so many victims that are in our chat that have been victims of child abuse as in their earlier parts of their lives and they're now in their 60s and 70s 40s and 30s and they're talking about it here so um again it, it's a tough conversation it's a tough topic i wanted to share uh anthony if you don't mind your website because you are in the business of digital forensics cyber security private investigations do you want to Talk a little bit about your website that we're looking at here. Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, so I, we do have uh, a I started up a cybersecurity uh, private investigation firm, uh, mainly focuses on 
uh, helping uh, attorneys, corporations, individuals uh, get to the bottom of get to the bottom of things, uh, mainly cyber uh, related instances, you know, hacks and, uh, you know, data exfiltration, um, you know, digital forensics. Uh, uh, so if, if anyone ever needs anything, feel free to reach out. Uh, we don't take every case, but we, we will listen to you, uh, your case and, and see if it's something that's in our wheelhouse. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to link that in the description. I believe it's there already. It's a clickable link. And his Instagram as well. He just started his Instagram page. so don't, don't, <laughs> He gave don't. me a little flack early. He's like, yeah. you only have one follower. I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> he, has one, he has one follower, but he just started the account. So if you guys go over onto Instagram, um, I will... I think I have it here. I told you that I was going to spare you the embarrassment. I'm going to show it. He's got one follower. <laughs> um, so there it is. Boom. But he just created it. So it's recent. It's a new account. Don't be afraid. Go over and follow him. Give him some love. He spent a good hour with us here. Um, I want to just also let you guys know a great way to continue the conversation is to leave us comments down below in the comment section let us know what you thought of the live stream let us know what you want to hear in the future but again if you don't have something nice to say just don't say it at all it's not worth it we don't really like bullying here and things of that nature so if you if you don't agree with some of the things or if there was miss words misspoken or if things aren't listen i'm sick as a dog right now i have a sinus infection i've got a, a upper respiratory uh, I've been down and out and on the balls of my butt for about five days right now. I've been feeling like crap, but I'm still going. I'm still pushing forward. And I wanted to bring this content for you because I thought it was important. A lot of people are talking about the cell phone data and all of the forensics. There's so much to do. And as Anthony said, there is so much that they have that they have available to them to get this information cyber crimes and you know cyber detectives they can do they can work magic correct yep i wouldn't call it magic it's you know <laughs> but it's uh just you know it, it it can seem like magic sometimes yeah but you yeah know, it's it's just thorough uh thorough you know dogged investigative work and just taking the time to go through the evidence and understanding what's happening on these devices yeah yeah absolutely and, and I, and I want to just also say uh, thank you to the replay viewers because they are some of the most engaged people. So for those of you who are watching on the replay, thank you so much. And for the new subscribers, I welcome you and I thank you for being here because the community here is growing and we're quickly approaching 300,000 subscribers. So I want to just say thank you to all of you. Ed Wallace is traveling with his family. He's in Sydney, Australia right now. He will be checking in back and forth. I saw him in the chat earlier. So, um, you know, give Ed, he needs he needs a little bit of R&R. &R. He works his tail off as well. He teaches for LSU and goes all over the country, and he also goes all over the world. So thank you all for being here, and I, I, I thank you first and foremost, Anthony, uh, for taking out your time and hanging out with us here tonight. Um, do you have any final thoughts as it pertains to forensics on this case? I'd, I'd say thank you for having me on. Um, in terms of final thoughts, I'd say the investigators involved in this, God bless them. Uh, it's, you know, in many cases, it's a thankless job. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm sure it's not. It's very rewarding. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, they're, you know, I, I'm confident that uh, you know, we'll, we'll get an answer, uh, you know, one way or the other, you know, if the evidence exists. And, and, I, and I feel strongly about that because, you know, a lot of people have the doubts. They, a lot of people like say, well, since we're not hearing anything, we're not getting autopsy results that they're dragging their feet. But that's why I keep trying to pound home. They're not dragging their feet. They're no, dotting their eyes. They, they're crossing their T's. They don't need to rush in this time. You know, there's no need. Like you said, he's, they got him on ice. And it's better for them to really build that case up so it's rock solid. Uh, as you as you know, you know, once you file that accusatory instrument, there's timers. There's, there's things that, you know, there's clocks that start ticking that, right. uh, you know, limit how far you can dig into. And at this point, you know, they started the clock on the uh, child exploitation material on the devices. Uh, but, 
you know, that homicide investigation, they're, they're going to take their time to make sure it's rock solid, um, you know, before Absolutely. making that accusation. And, and just so you know, here's one of my other um, stick of notes. His arraignment is going to be on uh, April 24th of 2024. Uh, he'll be arraigned on the charges. He may waive his appearance like he did as in a cowardly fashion the last time. And then they're talking about a trial from May. I put doubtful on May because his defense is going to want all of the discovery. There's no way that they can kick off 62 charges that they have right now against him in May. I mean, it's, it's a thought, you know, it's, it's a positive thought going forward, but don't count on that. But at the end of the day, he is sunk. As far as I'm concerned, when you look at this thing, barring some kind of something that would be massive mistake or massive, you know, stutter step, I, I, I don't see him being able to um, uh, defend against the damning videos and pictures, the vile videos and pictures that they have. Nancy, thank you for the well wishes. And Linda, thank you for the super sticker. Everybody, thank you for being here. Again, I want to just say that this is what it's about. Anthony, I'm just going to, we're going to end on this. Uh, and if you don't mind, just hang out for a second. Don't click out um, when I do the outro. I want to talk to you for a minute. Um, Madeline Soto, 13 years young. This is what this case is about. Justice for her, justice for her family, the ones who love her. Now, again, I don't want us point fingers at people, but we look at what we have and we send strength, prayers, and positive vibes to the detectives, the district attorneys, and everyone who has a hand in bringing justice for this girl. May she rest in peace and may we get justice for her. On behalf of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace, I want to wish you guys a good evening. Thank you for tuning in and God bless.